Queensland preparing to come out. Karina Brown leads her team out. Her second game as Queensland skipper. Her fourth appearance for a state. Final play. Down the short side. Some space. There's a try. It's Karina Brown, the Queensland skipper. Japoya, the dummy through. Brigham Shaw sends Brown over for a second. Lovely football. Brown and here's Simon. It's try number four. Brilliant work. Nearly kick, chasing through Karina Brown. Baker missed it. Karina Brown oh, has got between them. there. Yes. And stolen a try. Danger times here for the Ferns. Can they hold the Jillaroos attack? Numbers on the far side. It's going to be tough. Kelly is there. With a chip and chase, and Shaw on the bounce. Puts in another kick. Flying out after it was Nichols, but just getting there in time. Karina Brown, it was. Now, back to the accelerator. Karina Brown and I play rugby league for the Australian Gillaroos, the Sydney Roosters and the Queensland Maroons. So Karina, you've always been a bit of a natural leader. When you were in high school, you were the school captain of your high school, Marymount College. Uh, you were also the captain of our, our touch footy team. Uh, and more recently, you were the captain of the inaugural um, Queensland Rugby League State of Origin side. So how would you describe your leadership style? So, I, yeah, I was really fortunate to have um, some amazing opportunities in leadership. But when I was born, um, I actually had four sisters. and oh, Sorry, three sisters. I was the oldest. And so um, I guess I just learned natural leadership through being, you know, the eldest and showing them what to do or, or what to do. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it was just natural for me to find some leadership roles. And I guess I just love bringing people together. Um, and I suppose my leadership style <clears throat> is probably just around being being me, being my authentic self. I think as a leader, you don't always make the right decisions and things don't you know always go the way you plan. But if you're you act with good intentions um, and you have a good heart and you know you try to do the best by others by being yourself, then people will follow you through the good times and, and through the difficult times. So yeah, I just think it's about um, being yourself and um, showing people how authentic you are. Yeah, authentic leadership. I like it. Okay, so um, going more down the road of um, your the performance side of things, so mental preparation in elite sport is obviously a big factor of something that you need to be aware of and work on to make sure that you're in the best position um, on and off the field. Uh, what do you do in that space to make sure that you're looking after yourself and you, you're ready to go? Yeah, so mental preparation is key. And I've only really been learning more about it maybe the last sort of five years um, and in how critical it is to get right um, so you can perform on the field. And when you think about it, like we train our bodies every day. And if you're studying, you know, you're studying every day to be a builder, a hairdresser, a, you know, a lawyer. Um, same as brushing your teeth, like you do it every day. Um, so why don't we train our brains every day, you know, and look after our mental capacity? Like it's so important. So uh, I definitely prioritise that now and put just as much time into my me mental preparation as I do, um, you know, training in the gym and, and on the field. And some key things that I do around mental preparation, number one is sleep. Sleep is so important. So, you know, every night I've got my, my routine. So I've trained my brain that as soon as I basically hit my bed, like it's just, it's lights out so I can get a full eight hours. And I find that really helpful, even if you've had a stressful day or I've done a big training session, um, to go to sleep and get those eight hours or, you know, as many as you need, because everyone's different. Some people need 10, some people only need six, but whatever works for you, you know, waking up the next morning with that 
you feel fresh, you're energised and you can tackle any problems or, or any issues that you had the day before. Same with food, same with water. You, you really need to fuel and give your body and your brain, you know, the right fuel to be able to, to focus and um, put the best out on the paddock. So there are a few things that I do. And more recently, I also started getting into meditation. I know you've um, been trying that yourself. And Big advocate for meditation. <laughs> yeah, it's so amazing because there's so much happening in our lives every day. You know, you're a million things going on. So to be able to just stop, pause, even if it's just for five minutes in the morning, you know, five minutes in the evening to give yourself that mental break from all the stuff that's happening and just, just be, I mean, it's, it's really powerful and it's, it's really interesting what you take in um, just the sounds of nature uh, and, you know, just life around us. It's, it's really beautiful and really peaceful. So I find that um, really helpful and um, it's something that I now put into my, my morning ritual. And if I can do it at night, I also do it at night. And I think another critical thing, I mean, in life and school, like growing up, everyone says, you know, you've got to work hard and you've got to have your goals and you've got to achieve success. And, you know, that's that constant pressure to perform. And like you do need goals and it is um, really important that you've got a plan in place to, to achieve those goals. But something equally important as well as working hard is to have time out. And that's something that I didn't, you know, know about. I would just go, go, go. And then I would get to a stage where I'd have complete burnout. And then I, I wasn't training great. And, you know, I wasn't making good decisions at work or, you know, in my life. And it's because I didn't take time each week just to go, you know what, I'm just going to go to the movies today, or I'm going to go for a surf because I love it. I'm going to hang out with my friends. And it's so important that you do that just to give it again, you give your brain just a, a mental break. Um, and to be able to enjoy the journey. I think that's really important too. you know, we've always got these big goals, but if you're not enjoying what you're doing along the way, then you're going to miss out on, you know, so many fun opportunities. Yeah. Getting that balance as well, I guess. Yeah. Um, one thing that you said before, uh, or one thing actually watching that Jordan documentary, I think I was telling you the other day um, and they describe Michael Jordan as a bit of a, like a mystic in that he was so able to be in the present moment mm -hmm. and was able to play his, his game being present. I guess not. They said he'd, he would never worry about a shot that he hasn't taken yet, for example. So that idea of being present is an idea that I think I've heard a few sports psych psychologists and athletes talk about. Is that something that you are conscious of being in the moment and um and how does that play a role in in your performance absolutely and i have a good example actually when i first started playing rugby league when i was 21 i was playing fullback and it was just a regular local game you know there was nothing there wasn't a big game i wasn't in a stadium it was just local fun league and i had to catch the football and and i dropped it and i knocked it on and obviously the other team got the ball and that damaged me for years. Mm. For years, all I would think about every time the ball went up was that I was going to drop it. And I would then start letting the ball bounce and so then I could catch it on the bounce. And that was also, you know, not a great option because that's that can lead to the other team getting the ball. And sometimes I'd catch it, sometimes I wouldn't. Like it was a real 50-50 and it was all because I couldn't get out of my brain this one mistake that I'd made. That meant nothing in the big scheme of things. And... It took me a number of years um, to realise that that is in the, in the past and I can't control the past. All I can control is what's happening right now in this moment. And so I really had to change my mindset. Um, not, so when the ball went up, instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to drop it, I had to change it to, I'm going to catch this. And then I just started catching them. Like yeah. I rarely drop a ball now. And it was just from being in the present moment and knowing I can only control this, but also knowing, you know what? Everyone makes mistakes and things happen. So if this ball drops, we call it, um, basically when the, if something happens, you basically say, well, probably shouldn't swear, but stuff it and you move on. You know what I'm saying? So you just, you just leave it. You put it in the, in the bucket and you've got to get on to your next job. The next job is, um, okay, we've lost the ball. Now I've got to tackle for five, six tackles. We get the ball back, we go again. So yeah, being in that present moment is, is critical. And I, I loved... Um, that Jordan could just be in the moment and feel the flow in philosophy. I've been learning about philosophy the and they, flow, they call it, yes. yeah, they call it the flow. And 
Um, there's actually, I was playing um, rugby league just before COVID started. Um, we played one game and I hadn't played in maybe six months and just because of the end of last season. And I don't know why, but all of a sudden I thought, oh, do I even remember how to play footy? Like it's been six months. And I got out there and I was just completely in the moment. And it was really bizarre because I felt it out there. Like I was just moving well. I was seeing everything I needed to see. It was, it was like everything was in slow-mo and I could just make the decisions that I needed to make. And it's interesting because when I came off the field, I had about three different people, unrelated, comment on, it looked like I was walking on water. And that's basically what the flow is. Like, it just looks effortless. And it's because I was completely in, in the zone. You know, I wasn't worried about what happened. Last week, I wasn't worried about the future. It was just, I was loving football and I was there in that moment. Wow. That's cool. Um, all right, back to these questions. How, okay, so how do you respond to challenges? Challenges. Well, I've been challenged many times, uh, especially with injuries. I've had about six surgeries uh, in my career for football leagues. I'd oh, sorry, I'd never um, actually broken a bone before I started playing rugby league. So I've been playing for 10 years now and had six surgeries, which is obviously massive. And I actually think it was a, a blessing in disguise because each surgery, like you have to re build resilience to get through it. Um, I have a funny story. So I was made my third surgery. I'd done my first two surgeries in Brisbane and then I broke my collarbone and my surgery is going to be on the Gold Coast. And because I, you know, had some practice, I was like, who cares? Surgery, no worries. Six weeks, I'll be fine back on the field. Just Mr. Cool, calm, collected kind of guy. <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I'm, like, mum's dropped me off. She said, do you want, to, do you want me to come in? No, I'm good, mum. Don't worry, just get me later. So I've walked into um, the Gold Coast um, Hospital and in Brisbane they give me um, a gown and a hat to put on before surgery. So they've given me the gear and I'm putting it on again, thinking like I'm such a pro at surgery, this is easy. <laughs> and um, I was trying to tie up my um, outfit, my little, what do they call it? The, just the like scrubs? The no. scrub, the yeah, doctor, I, I don't know. <laughs> Put a little gown on. So I've opened up the um, door and I've said to the nurse, oh, do I tie it up at the back or the front? And she looks at me, you know, really weird. And I'm like, oh, like, what have I done? And she's like, no, you've got the gown tied up correctly. She's like, what have you done with the paper undies? And I put them <laughs> on my head. Because in Brisbane, we didn't get paper undies. We only got a hat. So, <laughs> So, and then I took them off and I had like the biggest pair of undies on my head. <laughs> I wasn't under any um, anesthetic yet. And I said, oh, I bet you get this a lot. And she said, no. So, uh, I guess the moral of the story is to stay humble. Um, <laughs> so that was a funny story. But yeah, back to challenges. Um, I think you've just got to look for the, the positives and, and work out a plan. Like I knew I could get better. I just needed to go, right, you know, what's required of me? Yep. At two weeks, you know, I've got to do this. At four weeks, I've got to do this. And you just work really hard. And I guess when you're so passionate, um, like, about the sport that I, I play, you know, I want to get back there. So I'm willing to do whatever it takes. But it also helped me a lot with, you know, things off, off the field, like, just in life. You know, that sort of resilience to know, you know, you can get through anything. I mean, COVID's the perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm really fortunate that I got to keep my job, but something that I love and done every day for 10 years, football got taken away. Mm -hmm. um, and I know everyone, you know, lost something in, important to them during this time. And it's okay to feel sad because I did, you know, the first week I was kicking stones like this sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, all my, my big plans seem to have gone out the window like everyone else has. And, but because of what I've learned through football, um, I found that I just made a plan. You know, what can I do? I mean, I can't train with the team anymore, but what can I do? Well, I can train by myself. Yeah. Okay, I can't go to the gym, but what can I do? Well, I, I can look around. I can find friends that have spare gym equipment. I've got a makeshift gym downstairs and it's pretty average, but it's still something that I can do. Uh, I can't see my friends. Yeah, sure. I can't see my friends, but I can ring them on the phone. I can create Zoom meetings with them. You just got to find another way. And once I did that, you know, after a week, 
well, this is basically my new life now. I actually can't imagine life the other way because I've been doing it for three months. So humans are naturally um, built to be resilient. And as I was saying, it's okay to feel like sadness and anger when things go wrong, but it's not okay to stay there. And I think that's a choice that you need to make um, to go, you know what? Yep. Things have hit the fan, but it's okay. I'm going to get through it and this is how I'm going to do it. So you just got to move forward and, and look for the positives. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Um, so we're talking about COVID that was, that works in well, cause that's my next question. Um, so the question was, how have you maintained your well-being during COVID? Which I guess you sort of already touched on um, talking about that that idea of resilience and focusing on the positives um, and you know adapting and your attitude really as well. Um, so does that answer that? Is there anything else you want to add to that about COVID or? Yeah, um, I think I yeah I did pretty much touch on it, but I also thought I could use this time. Um, to do something else. I thought, what, I'm going to sit in at home for a while. So I actually, um, Yale University in America, they gave a, um, a free online happiness course. So again, I thought, how can I enhance my, you know, well-being and my mental preparations? So I've, I'm halfway through the happiness course and it's really great. They, they teach you that people think to be happy, it's, you know, when you, you'll get happiness if you have the new iPhone, you know, a new house, a new car, Oh, if I get the best grades, if I, you know, play for Australia for rugby league and the science is actually saying that that's not the case. You know, you might feel a little bit extra happier in those moments, um, but they're not the key to happiness. And the key to happiness is actually um, about being, you know, grateful, you know, for all the things that you have in your life and, and living in the present moment through, you know, meditation and mindfulness and, oh no, I just lost my train of thought. That's so funny oh, that you say that about gratitude being a key to happiness, but also in the present moment, because I was reading something the other day and I can't, I forget what it was, but it was about if you want to get into the present moment, one of the best things that you can do in that moment to get there is to be grateful and it just gets you into the present moment. So that's really interesting that you, that you say that and practice that and that's in your course because it seems to be a thing. Mm. Yeah, well, you should, um, anyone that's watching this, look up uh, the, Resilience Pro uh, the Resilience Project. And it's a really great story um, about this guy, Hugh, and he basically finds, you know, this, the secret to happiness, which is around uh, mindfulness, uh, gratitude, and empathy. And you can actually create a, a daily journal um, to practice these skills. And we did it back in the 2017 World Cup, that's when he came and presented to us. And for the 30 days leading up to the, the grand final, um, we all practiced gratitude and we ended up winning, you know, the grand final, um, the World Cup final, which was, you know, amazing. And it's because we just took the time each day to be grateful for everything that was happening around us and, you know, not worrying about, you know, all the stresses because you can only control what you can control like in that moment. Um, so... Social well-being is quite important at the moment during COVID um, and social during these social distancing times. So in the spirit of that, um, what is the kindest thing that you've ever done for someone and also the kindest thing that someone's ever done for you? Okay, so this is, funnily enough, in the Yale course, they talk about <laughs> um, to be happy. It's um, all about doing acts of kindness. Because when you're performing an act of kindness for someone else, you're not just thinking about yourself. You know, like, as I said earlier, there's so much things happening, so many things happening in your brain and, and going on. But if you can actually then put your attention onto someone else, you know, you're not worried and stressed about yourself. You're thinking, how can I make this person's life better? Mm. And by doing a simple act of, of kindness, you get a hit of um, I think dopamine or something it's called. Um, yeah, and then the more you do it, you know, the more happier you're going to feel for oxytocin. It might be oxytocin. No, it's, oh yeah, that's it. Oxytocin. Good word. The love chemical. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you're a scientist. Not yeah. me. <laughs> I, I, I play football. But, um, yeah. So I think performing acts of kindness, I'm probably, I don't know. I don't have anything really like big. 
as such, but I just try to do little things because that feeling is so good. So for example, I have um, two housemates and one of them works as a refrigeration mechanic. So he's gone at 5 a.m. most days and gets home really late and he puts his washing on and it sits there all day. So I just started hanging it out for him. Um, and my other housemate was like, why, why do you do that? I'm like, well, he works really hard. You know, he works 12 hour days and I'm at home at the moment for COVID. It takes me five minutes to hang his stuff out. Like, why wouldn't you do that? It's just something so simple. He gets home from work. He's got, you know, clean clothes ready for the next day. And then it actually comes back around. It does. You know, the other day I came home and he had cooked dinner for me. Yeah. Um, So it's just, if people did more acts of kindness, you know, it'd be a way better place to live. And it's, it can even start with a smile. Actually, I walked into a shop the other day and someone was just, hi, how are you? And had the biggest smile and it was the best greeting. And, you know, I I must've been walking around just kicking around. And when I got that, I instantly felt really good. And yeah. then I wanted to pass that smile on. So then I'm walking to the next door like, hi, how are you? So, um, yeah, I, I don't really have any big examples, but I just think if you can be kind, you know, all day, every day, um, it will go a long way to making the world better. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right. So you have, well, you have always been a high achiever. And I can remember in high school, and I think you must have been around, I don't know, 14 or 15, and you somehow managed to score yourself a gig at CFM as the Burley B Arch. <laughs> and, um, and I can remember asking you at the time, like, how did you get that job? And you said, well, I basically just, <laughs> just rang them every day or emailed them or did something every single day yeah. um, and, until they gave you that job or created that job, I think, for you. Um, so that attitude is like that real can do the sky's the limit sort of attitude. And do you think that that attitude has helped you become who you are as an athlete and like achieve what you've achieved today? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was growing up, uh, my grandma, she basically oh. had a saying, like, yeah, Grebs, you know, Grebs? really well. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I don't know. She was still with us, but I, I always feel that she's with me um, every day. In fact, when I'm on the field, I always look up and I'm like, oh, I need, I need the ball now. Please get it to me. And yeah. then, you know, it magically comes. So thanks. <laughs> yeah. Always listens and looks out for me. Um, but she had a couple of mantras that she taught me, and one of them was um, about feeling the fear, but doing it anyway. You know, so many times I'm really scared. I don't want to do something. Um, even last year, I had to do my first presentation by myself for an hour, and I wanted to say no initially because I, that just seemed very scary to talk to you know a whole room of people about myself. And I thought, no, what would Grebs do? She said, you know, feel the fear and and do it anyway. So I overcame my fear and I did this one hour presentation and it went really well. And um, I've been managed. I've managed to do that, you know, my whole life with with anything. Just whatever it is, just just have a go. And you know, if you still think it's scary, well, at least you tried it. <laughs> you can. You don't have to do it again. And um, but most times, you surprise yourself and you really enjoy it. And you know, you continue it on. And the other mantra she said was, "If if you don't ask, the answer's always no." So coming back to to CFM, you know, I really wanted to be part of the radio crew. I thought that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. So, you know, I just kept asking and (laughs) until they said yes. And again, I always tried to do that, you know, in my life, like you don't have to be, you know, super annoying about it, but if you're so passionate, it's hard to push someone back, right? It's hard to say no to someone if they keep showing up and they keep doing the work. And, and I've always been a, a pretty hard worker, as I said, but, but I've had to, I had to really learn that it's okay to say no sometimes as well. Mm. You know, I used to say yes to everything because I'd heard that somewhere along the line, you know, say yes, yes man. <laughs> the movie. Yeah, the yes man. <laughs> but it's like burnout is a real thing. Yeah. And you don't need to absolutely smash yourself because you're not really enjoying it anymore. Mm. And I think a few years ago, like I didn't get picked for whatever, which team it was, or Jillaroos or maybe it was Queensland. And I was... um. I was so disappointed, right? Mm. And I had to just stop and, and reflect and think, how good, be grateful 
how good has it been all the opportunities that I've had? You know, and now I've just had one step back. You know, is it the end of the world? No, it's not. And why do you, why do I play rugby league? And why do you do anything? Mm. It should be because you love it. That should be the first, you know, and, and most important thing. So I just, then just decided from that moment, okay, I'm going to play rugby league and I'm only going to play because I love the game and because it's fun. Yeah. I mean, growing up with you guys in school, like I played touch football because it was fun, you know. I didn't care about making the teams. I just wanted to play with my mates. Mm. So, but when you get to that sort of elite level, you know, the, the bar's always set so high for yourself. Mm. But if you fall short, it can be quite detrimental unless you have the tools to be able to go, you know what, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm just going to go again. You know, I'm doing this because I love it. And um, I think that's critical. So please remember that, guys. Um, if it's your passion, you know, do it because you love it. And anything else is just a bonus. You know, anything else is a bonus for me now. If I make a team, I'm like, how good is this? It's an extra, but I, I don't do it just for that. Um, you're doing like keynote talks now, like the one that you talked about that you sort of rose up to that challenge and um, which is awesome. And so um, a lot of what you talk about is obviously leadership, um, but you are also a champion of inclusion and all things inclusion is, is a bit of a passion of yours uh, and also uh, women in sport. So I don't know what my question is, but do you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah. Some of those passions. So last year, I, I, last year when I did that presentation for the first time, I spoke about um, leadership, inclusion and women in sport. And I think my stance on leadership is that everyone's a leader. Um, and the reason everyone is a leader um, is because everyone influences someone in some way. You know, it might just be your friend. You know, you could be a parent to your, to your child or um, just anything really. Like, so I, I, I don't think the question is... Um, who is the leader? I think it's what sort of leader do you want to be? And really having a look around your circle and having to think about um, who is it that's actually following me and what sort of example do I want to set for them? Um, I think that's really important. And then in regards to uh, inclusion, last year um, when I did the presentation, I, I spoke about um, Dan Reynolds. And Dan Reynolds is the front man for the uh, lead singer of Imagine Dragons. You would have heard the song if you, if you Google it. Yeah. And he made this documentary called Believer. And I just stumbled across it. And it was so powerful. So he's actually um, a Mormon. And he realised that in his church and in their beliefs is they're against, you know, um, being gay, basically there was a huge suicide rate within the Mormon community. And he had this most amazing saying, um, it, it opened up the documentary and it was, if you want to change the world, start with your community. And so what he does with his platform of being a performer uh, is he brings awareness and um, tells everyone it's okay to be you. And he created a, a concert um, in America um, you know, flying the gay pride flag. And he's not gay himself, but he just realised it's not right to, you know, not have equality in the world. Um, and so I really just harnessed that. Like I said, you know, anyone is a leader. And so I just took that and thought, okay, what can I, what can I learn from Dan? And then how can I then bring it into my life and, and spread that word? And so I decided to start wearing um, the rainbow flag on my wrist um, during rugby league. So last year we played State of Origin. Now we went live to 1 million viewers. It was the biggest, you know, TV crowd we've ever had for a women's game. Yeah. Uh, and I thought I can use my platform for change. You know, I may not be able to sing what I want to say, but I can run out there, you know, wearing the, the rainbow flag. And if a million people see that rainbow flag, that might spark a million conversations in the lounge room um, and just bring it to the for forefront that it's okay to be yourself and, um, you know, everyone should feel included and be able to, you know, yeah, be themselves. Like, it, it's terrible to think that people can't be themselves. Isn't it? Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's awful. So, yeah, just trying to spread the message of love. And that's another reason that I love rugby league is because it truly is a game for everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're tall, short, strong, you know, there's, there's a position for everyone on the field. You know, we have um, backs and we have forwards. And, and again, when I go to rugby, when I go to our trainings, like 
I just feel part of a community. It doesn't matter if I'm gay. No one cares. All I care about is that I'm going to do my job on the field, you know, and stick up for them. And I expect that from my teammates as well. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, a lot of powerful messages that you can take from others and, and then try and spread in your own way. And that's just basically what I'm trying to do. So, yeah, I'm willing to spread that message. So if you've got a gig for me, I'll, I'll come and speak for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I had a couple of things that I want to say on that. I need to remember the first one. Sorry. Oh, what you said about, um, so we teach leadership camps here at the Runaway Bay Sports and Leadership Excellence Centre. Um, and we, we think that leadership is relevant to everyone because no matter if someone wants to be a leader of others, everyone is a leader of themselves. But I really like what you said about um, uh, leaders... Influ- like everyone influencing someone exactly like it could just be a friend like people look up to you and, and you just you don't know like but you've really got to take the time to look around and and realize who is following you and like I said it's not about are you a leader it's what sort of leader do you want to be for those people around you that are, are watching and people are watching you all the time you know even on Instagram mm. um, you know I, I've got a few followers now so when I'm posting I'm, I'm thinking about you know, what matters to them, which is, you know, around women in sport and in inclusion and being a good person because, you know, that's the positive influence that I want to have on them if, if they're following me. 